Winchester Model 71. All of the parts aren't here. There's a bottle of Rust Blue from rustblue.com. We'll call this conspicuous product placement. But at the end of the day, we're gonna go ahead and drive the bluing back down on this. I don't know if you can see it, but this gun is silver over here, right? Its original blue is down here. We're gonna punch the bluing back up on this. We're not gonna polish anything. The biggest thing you're gonna get out of this particular episode is how to put this thing back together again. And that is a dive down the rabbit hole unto itself. Let's go. The number one thing that screws up bluing jobs is oil. And why do I have a, pi a picture of crystal eye drain opener on here? This stuff is poisonous. It is about as caustic as they come. But I'm going to tell you what, if you want to get every last drop of oil off of something, the guys that do thumbprint Damascus barrels, you don't have to they use this stuff you don't have to boil it you just get it a little bit warm set it out in the sun mix up a quantity of this stuff and you'll probably note that i'm not the biggest proponent of gloves you better bet your sweet bottom i got gloves up to my elbows when i'm touching this stuff because this stuff will screw you up it'll turn your other eyebrow white holy cow but we're gonna soak all this stuff in a tank of lye and we're gonna use that to get all the grease off. What grease does, grease creeps, it causes water to wet and pull back. It will mess up your bluing jobs. The oil on your steel wool will mess up your bluing job. Anything, the oil on your fingers will mess up your bluing job. This particular gun, I'm just gonna blue it. We've got a lot of episodes on how to blue stuff, how to rust blue. I do not hot dip. That's me, personally, I do not hot dip. Um, there are a lot of guys that do. This gun would look good hot dip, but I'm not going to polish it. The polish on this gun is actually beautiful. It's very well. It's, it's nice. So we're going to leave all of this and we're going to pick this back up. This is one thing that rust bluing will allow you to do. It'll allow you to blue right over the old stuff and it all blends back in again. But here's what I'm talking about, about places that oil can hide underneath this spring well golly i don't want to take this apart because this is this is hard to put back together again but you can see it's silver all right um let's put something that's actually blue up against it you see what i mean this is blue this is silver we're going to want to get under here so a true bluing job you've got to take the gun all the way apart yeah just do anyway take my word for it and um we're gonna blue this real quick. We have, an ex we have a pretty decent episode up on how to blue a gun from the bottom up. And I'm gonna give you guys the link here to go see it and um, go do that. When we come back, this thing will be, all the parts that are laid out here are the parts that you can see. The rest of the gun is sitting in a tub, you see, and, and we don't need to do these parts. We just need to do these parts. And as I said up front, the biggest deal about this is going to be how do you put this thing back together again? Because I'm going to tell you what, it almost confounded me. I think uh, Bruno and I are going to have to practice this a few times for you guys to get to see it. And like on the Winchester Model 40, we will cut you to the chase for the 13 people that actually own one of these things that work. So here's what I'm talking about. This is the loading gate right here. And right up inside this corner of the loading gate here, there's mung in that corner. That will screw up your bluing job. Here, well, let me get my fingers on this, right here. There we go. Right here, see that? And this gun was scrupulously clean, but there is oil impregnated up there, and that was hiding under that spring, you see? That had to be dug out. So now in the mortise that it was sitting in, you can see right here, there's, there's dirt. Well, that dirt has oil in it. That oil will, by capillary action, wind up on top. It will screw up your bluing job. So whenever you're gonna blue a gun like this, you gotta be 
absolutely anal about cleaning it and there's just no other way to put that see it was totally clean on this side but not clean on that side right all right here's the big one right here so there's a spring-loaded detent that holds this lever shut when the gun comes up right this spring-loaded detent most people would leave it I don't want to drive that pin that's a pain in the neck yeah but I'm gonna tell you what this thing is wet see that right there is a spoil bluing job right on the end of my finger right there that this spring let's just roll this around see all that fun just showed up on my fingers but that's the stuff that screws up your bluing jobs front sights are famous for this underneath the front sight you'll see everybody's bluing jobs got like a little ring of white around the muzzle because of the front sight um yeah i mean at what point you just have to know that when you're degreasing let's say a front sight okay this has obviously been driven out a couple of times by a couple of people because you can see he's had a crap beat out of it but up underneath that dovetail there is oil hiding underneath that this front sight will have to come out of its dovetail now this is actually part of the barrel so we don't have to worry about it getting up but a lot of times these are screwed down and those will be harboring it Rear sight dovetails are famous for this. Right here, this rear sight dovetail, if you look, you can actually see there's a little bit of oil up in there. That's got to be gone. Here, hang on a minute. Yeah, right there. See that? That's all got to get gone. Oh, wow, the winter wonderland happens when you get up inside this thing. So that's what that live oil is going to do, is it's going to get into all those little crevices, nooks and crannies. The gentleman that owns this gun is well aware of the fact that a whole bunch of holes had gotten drilled in it. We know that. It's not a pristine 71 from 1936. We get it. There used to be a side saddle mount on this. Um, the two holes may or may not, these two may or may not have been there. They were an option in 36. Who cares? We'll clean all this up, but if you think there's no room for bleed out, if you leave those screws in, you're going to have white rings around them, and you need that to go away too. All right, just food for thought. This is probably the most screwed up screw on the gun. The rest of them are in really, really good shape. The screw heads weren't mauled, nothing. This particular one, so all I'm doing is just taking a hammer those of you that actually have watched some of my videos to see me do this before so what I'm doing is pushing all that displaced metal back down in you can see those two silver strips those two silver strips are the metal that has been displaced back into the screw head now this one isn't particularly all that big so it's a little hard to see I'll do a bigger one all I'm doing here is just tapping the edges back in so at the end of the day I've kind of reformed that slot. If the slot is really, I'll tell you what, hang on a minute. Ah, there we go. This screw did not come off this gun. However, it will allow me to demonstrate what I'm talking about. So this particular screw here has really seen better days. Ill-fitting Ill -fitting screws, uh, screwdrivers, I'm sorry. And Bruno had said it while we were on break. It's a cascading failure. It's failure of, you know, this guy messes it up with this screwdriver, the next guy's screwdriver doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. Ad infinitum, ad nauseum, etc., etc. Okay. So what we're doing is we don't go for a file first. We're just beating all this material back down into this slot. Okay. This block that I'm using here is called a watchmaker's bench block. You don't have to have a watchmaker's bench block to do this hella strip of steel with a couple of holes drilled in it'll work. All I'm doing here now is just flowing the metal back in, flowing it back in. And in this particular case, we have a fairly large screw slot. So we can take a hacksaw. Now all a hacksaw is is a file with just one row of teeth. So we can actually direct this hacksaw 
up into the corners here you see we can come up on the edge we can clean that up clean that up just wield this hacksaw like well bob ross used to wield a um paintbrush i saw a really interesting thing on bob ross they took every one of the paintings he did and it looks like he's just flying up the hudson river valley it's cool my god that guy had talent oozing out of his fingers and i'd been compared to him once and i'm nowhere near that man so don't even worry about it okay so here we go here we go so now we've gotten the slot tightened back up now we'll take it over and clamp it in a, um, in a, in a screw, in a screw lathe or what I would call a drill motor. Okay. So we get over here. Now I've been asked, the man owns a lathe. Why is he spinning his screws in, in a drill motor? Well, here's the thing. Try this with a lathe. Grab your chuck with a lathe. It'll eat you alive. You can't do that. So there's nothing here that can grab you. There's not enough horsepower. That's why I prefer to do screws in something that I have a little bit more control over. take a little 220 grit sandpaper any grit the finer the grit the shinier the screw head this particular gun doesn't have really shiny screw heads so we'll just use some 220 okay that slot if it breaks through the sandpaper and you're doing this will cut the crap out of your fingers don't do that always back your sandpaper with something here Okay. okay, so now we've taken that nasty looking screw and we'll go one step further, but I'll do the screw that we just did. You don't need to grab it real hard. You don't want to grab it too hard or else you mess up the threads, right? Have it turning towards you. I'm not removing too much material, I'm just cleaning it up. Hey, when you're working with screws this small, sweep the floor before you start, not after you're done. Because if I drop this, now it hit a mat and I'll stand a fighting chance. Before this, we were pulling the, the flash hider off of a 50 cal, and I had wood chips everywhere because I had to make a a, a a sabo to hold on to the thing so we could grab it in the vise without screwing it up. All right, over to the fire pot. So here's the secret to this setup. I've got the torch up and away. Ordinarily, I'd have it rolled down, but we got to see it for the camera. Um, you have a dedicated pair of dedicated pair of pliers that have had the temper drawn off them eons ago and you can just light the torch and leave it alone and now because the stock is controlling i'm sorry the vice is controlling the torch i don't have to worry about dropping the torch or cutting the hoses with it or whatever so we're just going to get this screw hot here and i'm going to start don't don't heat the head up just heat the heat the body up and we'll let the color bloom through and obviously on a smaller screw, this would have happened already. So you see how it's starting to turn gold? And then it will we'll get like kind of a purplish tint to it. And that's just the color climbing up the, climbing up the stalk. We'll add some more heat to it. A little more heat. Just about there. So it'll start to turn blue, and then when it turns blue, I'm just going to dunk it in the oil. See, I dunked it in the oil and see it smoking here. And what that does is that stops the color change from happening. Let me do the other screw. Now, this one's going to change in a hurry. The reason why I like heating from the bottom is the heat comes up the stalk, 
and blooms from the inside out. If you heat them up from the top, the rim will change colors quickly and then they'll go gray and it, it doesn't look as good if you heat them up in the front. Okay. You don't need a huge amount of fire for this. Just take your time. Now, this is a temper blue, and I can hear the people yelling already. That's not very durable. You're right. But this is one way of doing it, and they look good. They're all going to be silver in a year anyway, because this man's probably going to do the maintenance and actually take this gun apart and clean it once a year. Just about there. And it'll run through this color. If it goes like to a really light bluish gray, you got to polish it down and start over again. Here we go. Now it's starting to turn blue. Throw it down here on the towel. Get a relight. You got to argue that that is a little sexier looking than what we started out with. Anyway, just do all the screws on the gun the same way. Or you can rust blue them. You can do that. And if you have that time, there's nothing wrong with it. And I'm going to tell you what, the rust blue on a screw is absolutely durable. It just do the prep exactly the same way. And then when you got them cleaned off, swab on the rust bluing solution, let them prog up for five or six hours, throw them in a steam box and you're done. Like I said, we've covered that. So do that to the rest of the screws, polish them all down. Here we have a pile of uh, polished up screws, fire blue them all. Here's the steady lineup of all of them after they've been blued. And then if you're wondering how to do those little itty bitty screws in the back, take your trusty screw plate. You've got one for number six, number eight, number 10, 12, blah, blah, blah. Thread that screw into the 840 screw hole, kiss it on the scotch Sprite wheel, and Viola, a polished screw head, and go ahead and do it in the fire too. Three forty-eight Winchester, big, dumb, and slow wins the race every time. There it is. Now we got a full day tied up in that. And go to RussBlue.com, and he'll explain how we do it. We have tons of videos up on how to do a good Ross bluing, but you got to admit that's a significantly better looking piece of kit than it was when it was silver. I'm um, I'm happy with this. Now we got to finish cleaning the rest of the parts, assemble this thing and learn how to put it together. Cause I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm not real, not real sure how this gun goes together. And when I'm done, I'll know how to do it. And just like the model 40, we'll take it through, uh, putting it back together again so that you understand what order everything goes in, but you can do this. It can be done. It does not take thousands of dollars of high speed, low drag stuff. There's so many of these guns that are dropping on the market now as all these baby boomers are dumping their collections. You got to know what to do with it because there is a lot of deferred maintenance in all of these collectible guns. You got to know how to get that deferred maintenance out of it and start using them as tools because they ain't making any more of them. All right. Uh, on that note, I'm going to pull the rest of the parts out and we'll get this thing back together again. The rest of the, the, the oilings on the stock, the checkering, everything's catching up to the back end. And then the wood and the, um, the wood and the metal will get back together again. And then you get to be able to see what this is starting to look like and why it was worth doing in the first place. So in broad daylight, it's a pretty good looking piece of kit. Winchester model 71. Um, we put it back together again. We don't have all the little exterior screws in it because when you get to this point on a restoration project, you really need to put it together and shoot it. And uh, we got to make sure all these checkering diamonds stay in one spot. 348 Winchester. Stomping round, a lot of case capacity, a lot of black powder cartridges get made out of this. Um, I think they intended this to be an elk round. And in fact, this gun had lived out west. Ejection is straight over your shoulder. Keep track of those empties though, because those things are expensive. Absolutely. I'm gonna save a round for Bruno here, because at about $4 a piece, those get a little pricey, don't you think? But it definitely goes bang. You can hand me one of those empties for a moment. 
or I'll just generate another one. It's a little bit warm, huh? <laughs> I'm looking for firing pin strikes in the middle. I'm trying to make sure that none of the brass is uh, degraded. The rifling on this thing is absolutely awesome. Um, we're there, so now we gotta go back and uh, debrief what happened out here and take it all the way back apart again and adequately lubricate it. I tend to not oil them too much before these test runs because I don't like to get fogged, if you know what I'm talking about. So this Winchester Model 71 came in here. It was silver. The wood finish was nasty. Um, it just needed a refresh. We did the maintenance. 99 of these guns die from a lack of maintenance for every one that is, you know, what is this thing worth? Is it worth 50% and 3% or is it worth 50% of 100%? You don't know because you don't know what this gun looked like before I started working on it. Um, some of you may notice that the color's a little mismatched. I'll drive that in. There's another month's worth of work to do on this gun in terms of finishes and waxes and all that stuff. But we got the big part across was a nice tight rust blue. We didn't mess with polish. We just left the thing the way it was. We didn't take the existing bluing off the gun. We just caught up the areas where it had been worn off. The uh, reassembly of this thing was really convoluted. It took Bruno and I about two hours of figuring out the order because unlike an older Winchester where you drive a screw out here run the pin out and pull the bolt out the back the lock and blocks drop through then you take the stock off then you take the bottom metal out not on this particular one the bolt has to be almost all the way out you drop the lock and blocks out drive a pin out with the with the bolt all the way back and then the carrier and the lever have to come out at the same time but wait you have to trap the energy of the main. This thing is going to get its it's going to get its own video because it deserves it, if only because the owner of the gun needs to know how to heck take it apart and work on it. But it is not like any other Winchester. And if I were you, unless you're pretty heavy duty into using tools and disassembling the Chinese fingers that are this Depression era Winchester, I hate to say this, but I wouldn't do it until we show you the sequence of steps. So just like in the Winchester Model 40 video, and that shotgun took us, oh dear God, three days to learn how to get it apart in the right order. Once we learned the order, we were out and back in again in 10 minutes. So we'll do that for you guys. It isn't going to fit in this video. We got to get on with it. And as always, it's been a pleasure and will continue to be so. Yeah, it's not that bad, but it's like a 12-gauge shotgun. Or half the fucking bark falls off the tree. Right where you were looking. Look at that hole. Look at that fuck. That's I had it sighted in, didn't I? Metal in its unprotected state will eventually corrode. It will corrode into what collectors call patina. Patina is deferred maintenance. These are all my opinions and they've gotten me lit up. But I've got to tell you, at the end of the day, collected firearms that have not had any maintenance done on them have a deferred maintenance penalty put into them. You have to take that deferred maintenance penalty back out of something that was never maintained. I do not understand when a lack of maintenance becomes more valuable. I cannot wait until 100 years from now when somebody's trying to retroactively figure out the formula for Cerakote because, oh no, somebody took the 18-inch barrel off of this collectible AR and put a 16 on it. How dare they? I don't get it. I really don't. At the end of the day, this particular gun got 
it's it's got a lot of scabbard wear. It was run, the internals on this gun are not worn that much, but there's a lot of scabbard wear. Everything has been completely, just totally run off of it. The bluing is missing on the bottom where your hand would go, where it would rub. Bluing's missing up here on the nose cap where the scabbard would go. We're just doing the maintenance on this gun. And if you do the maintenance the right way, you're not going, no one's going to know that you did it. But I've just recently, we did an episode where we took a Mauser back from dead. We converted all the rust off of it and we did no bluing and we did no wood finish on it. And I got lit up for screwing up some priceless collectible. And to be really honest, I've had enough of it. So this is just my opinion. At the end of the day, if you don't do the maintenance sooner or later, someone's gonna have to pay the bill. This particular owner is doing the maintenance on this particular gun. We're going to rust blue this whole thing and we're gonna do that maintenance and we're gonna zero that deferred maintenance bill out. I've never heard of anybody talk about patina on airplane. Airplanes have to be maintained. Well, why the heck doesn't a gun have to be maintained? Automobiles have to be maintained or else they're trailered piles of garbage. And I know the automotive guys get a little twitchy about this topic, but I don't. Should it be original? Yes. The only way to truly make something original is to do it the way Jay Leno does it. Jay Leno can take a pile of garbage and bring it back from the dead. We really can't do that here. All we can do is rust blue the metal and bring the old finish back off of a piece of wood. That's all we can do. Bring the old finish back, chase, chase out the checkering because they're not making any more of these. The argument kind of holds water. That there are newer versions of it, but there are no newer versions. This gun was made into the 1950s and then they stopped. So the newest one of these things is in its 70th year. We gotta do the maintenance. Do the maintenance. That's my rant for the year. And we're gonna now film a video on rust bluing this particular gun and moving on. But at the end of the day, if you're not doing the maintenance, what you're arguing for is that something that is priceless because it is not being made anymore should be allowed to degrade and we're gonna collect the degree to which it is degraded. Are you kidding me?